this word trend? What do you think of? What do you think of when I say, what is the trend, for example? What are the trends today? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Fashion, social media, things like that. So it's like, what is the trend with social media right now? What's everyone doing right now? Instagram, Twitter, yes? Okay, so there are different trends. And so people tend to follow these trends. And so maybe there's a fashion trend that people follow. So we're gonna be talking about our periodic trends. And the periodic table itself actually has a whole bunch of trends. And so scientists have studied these. And there is a man by the name of, anybody remember his name? Dimitri Somebody that actually came up with the first organization. He was the first person to organize a periodic table. Mendeleev, awesome. Dimitri Mendeleev. So this was back in the 1800s. And he ended up coming up with a setup of the periodic table. And it was not the same as what we do now. Right now, how is it organized? And this was done by Mosley. How is it organized now? Atomic by atomic number. And atomic numbers represent the number of what in the atom? The protons. Perfect. And so now we know that these blue numbers represent the number of protons. That's how it's organized now. And that was as of like 1913. But before that, in the 1800s, well, how did Mendeleev had it organized? It wasn't perfect. It was by mass. It was by weight or by mass is the way that it was organized at that time. And so it does follow trends, though. And so we know that we call what goes up and down on the periodic table, what do they call those? Groups. Awesome. They call those groups. Or what else do they call those? Families. families. Very good. These are called families or they're called groups. And why are they called families? Because they're alike. They're alike. They're similar. They're chemically similar to each other. And so we say that these are alike. Whereas if you go across the periodic table, they call those periods. periods. Very good. And so then the periods are just basically showing us an increase in the atomic number or our number of protons. So we're going to be talking about our, a couple of trends, um, a few of the trends. We're going to talk about three specific ones. And there are going to be explanations. And the explanations we're going to base on two major factors. So I'm going to take something that's so extensive, like the periodic table, and we're going to try to simplify it and bring it down to two major things that we can discuss as far as why these trends exist. Okay? So we pull this down here, and we're going to get started on these notes. So it says the periodic table and its setup has told us many things. And we can make generalizations about atoms and their properties based on the setup of it. So these generalizations we're calling the periodic trends. And these trends, they can be predicted based on the periods and the groups that they're in. What do you call the vertical columns on the periodic table? So remember, horizon, horizontal goes this way. What are the vertical ones called again? We call those groups or families. Perfect. So the groups or the families are the vertical columns on the periodic table. Whereas what are the horizontal rows called again? Periods. Periods. Very good. The three trends that we're going to be discussing are radius. What, what do you think atomic radius is referring to? What of the atom? Basically what? How big it is? The size. So this basically is referring to the size of the atom. Okay, then we see something called ionization energy. Well, it's the energy to do something. What inside of here, what word are you seeing? Ion. ion. And what's an ion? It's a particle that carries a charge. Perfect. But we're specifically going to talk about the energy required to remove an electron. Okay, it's the energy that's required to remove electrons an electron or multiple electrons. And then this word here, electronegativity. Well, the beginning of it, the stem is, what is what do you think we're talking about? Electron. Electrons. And what charge do they have? Negative. Negative charge. Well, what we're basically talking about is there's an attraction that happens for another atom's electrons. And so this is basically talking about a measurement of an atom's ability to attract electrons. Okay? So it's attracting electrons. It's basically an atom's ability to attract electrons. What holds an electron to the atom? What actually keeps the electron basically tied to an atom? The what? The orbit. And so we know that in an atom, what's in the nucleus? And I may have heard this. Perfect. We've got protons. So what holds the electrons to the nucleus? The protons. And what do we say? What do we know about opposites? Attract. Attract. Awesome. So this opposite attraction, this positive and negative, starts with an E. We call it the electro. Anybody want to take a guess at what the ending is? It's 
called the electrostatic attraction. It's called the electrostatic attraction. And that's what basically keeps the electrons tied or bound to that particular atom. So we're going to draw Bohr's model, a very simple model. Remember, Bohr's model is different from the quantum model in that the major thing is we don't see it as electrons orbiting anymore. We say that the electrons are in, not they're not orbiting, they're in, what do we call those clouds? Orbitals. Orbitals. Awesome. And so we know that it's all based on probability. It's, we're not exactly sure where the electrons are, but we know that with high probability they would be within a particular area around the nucleus. And we call those energy levels. So let's say that we've got our nucleus right here. We're just going to draw a really simple atom. So we've got our nucleus, and we've got in the nucleus, we've got protons and we have neutrons. But remember, our protons are positive and our neutrons are charged how? Neutral. Neutral. So do they really, the charge of the nucleus, they don't matter, so the charge of the nucleus would be positive. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the first energy level, and in the first energy level, I can have two electrons. So remember, it's just a 1s2, so I'm going to have two electrons in my first energy level. In the second energy level, anybody remember? It went 2, 8, then what? 8, 18, 32. Awesome. So in the second energy level, we can have 8. And the reason why we can have 8, remember, it went 2 in the 1s2, and then it went 2s2, 2p6. So you're adding 2 plus 6. In the third energy level, we had a 2, a 6, but then we had plus 10 because this was a 3D. So it goes 2, 8, 18, and then the 32 comes after that. So we're going to have 8 electrons here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then if we had our third energy level, then we would have 18 electrons in the third energy level. And I'm just going to write 18 electrons going all the way around there. Okay, so this is a simple model. Again, they don't travel, the electrons don't move in orbits. We know that they're in cloud shapes, but just to kind of give us a nice idea of what's happening in the first level versus the second level versus the third level. So there are two major things that we're going to talk about when we discuss these trends and why these trends happen. One thing is called the shielding effect, okay? And so everyone do this and pretend that you're holding a shield in front of your face, okay? So we're going to call this the shielding effect. And the reason why we're doing this, there were um, some studies that went out that said that if you could actually connect a motion to a particular statement, then you had an easier time memorizing it. Your brain would actually remember it so that if I do this, you would actually think shielding. And we'll do a little bit of this um, later during the hour, too. So... When we talk about shielding, what happens is, I'm going to basically use an analogy of going to your favorite concert to see your favorite band, your favorite performer, your favorite singer, okay? So, um, for example, my son loves Ariana Grande. And so, in yesterday, last night, there was this all-star basketball thing and she was performing. He probably would want to be where? There. Right there and where right there? in front of her, okay? How many of you have ever been to a concert where you basically were in that first section, like pretty much front row, right in the front with your favorite performer there, okay? Between you and the performer, a lot of times, it looks like the person's actually singing to you, okay? You're like, they're singing directly to me, they're talking right to me, and so you've got this really strong attraction. But as you move, move further and further out, so I'm gonna tell you that I was at a concert, and I remember, um, being a long time ago, being at Depeche Mode, and all, I could, all we could get were lawn seats. And we were way out there, okay? What's the attraction like? Well, there's still a strong attraction for me, but if I need to go and use the restroom, there's a lot more movement happening outside here. People are socializing, people are going to get food, they're sitting on their blankets, and there's just a lot of talking going on. The attraction's a lot stronger in here. What ends up happening is, these people that are in front of you, these electrons that are surrounding this nucleus, are basically shielding the attraction, okay? So the inner electrons will block the outer electrons from the proton's attraction. So the electrons that are farther apart from the nucleus, then what, do you, what would you say about their attraction? Is it stronger or is it weaker as they move farther away? Weaker. It's weaker, perfect. 
So they experience a weaker attraction out here is a weaker attraction versus inside there, the electrons that are closer to the nucleus are going to have a stronger attraction for that nucleus. That's it. That's the shielding effect. And the idea is that the more energy levels that you have, the more your shielding effect takes, press, takes um, effect. Okay. So the next thing, and we're going to always do that for going down the periodic table. It's always going to be shielding. The next thing is called the effective nuclear charge. Everybody do this now. An effective nuclear charge is going to be our reason for going across the periodic table. Now you can also do this or you can do this and make the letter Z. Okay? So it's going to be the beginning to the letter Z is what we're doing right now. So you can do this or you can do this to make it a letter Z. It doesn't really matter. Okay? I'm just going to do this and I'm going to call this Z effect. Everybody say Z effect. Z effect. Okay. So this is called the effective nuclear charge, and they're giving it a symbol of Z-E-F-F. -F. The word effective, so we know that it's something that's taking effect on something else. And now we're seeing the word nuclear or nuclear charge. Well, what's what stem? What are you seeing there? You know the nucleus, nucleus. and what's inside of the nucleus are protons, protons and neutrons, neutrons, but what's the charge of it? Positive. Positive because the neutrons are neutral. So the only thing that matters is in your nucleus as far as charge is concerned is our protons. So what we're basically talking about is the number of protons in the nucleus. So it says the nuclear charge experienced by the outermost electrons of an atom. So we're gonna say that basically the number of protons will affect the pull on what? on the electrons because the electrons are negative negative. and what you have to do though is you have to look at shielding first okay and shielding is going up and down on the periodic table so again make your shield real quick so shielding is going to be going up and down on the periodic table if you're going diagonally and you're trying to compare two atoms and their trends you would go up and down and shielding takes precedence look at that first and then look at the effect okay so let's talk about radius so it says atomic radius is the distance from the center of the atom to the outer edge. That's pretty easy, isn't it? So we're talking about the center of the atom out to the outermost edge. Pretty simple. And it says as you move down a group, the radius of the atom becomes what? Well, if we go down a group, so let's take a look at something like hydrogen or lithium or francium. Lithium has how many protons? Three. So then it has three electrons, okay? And depending, it may have a similar number of neutrons depending on what isotope you have. Francium has how many protons? 87. So it's got 87 protons, and if it's neutral, it also has 87 electrons. So which one do you think is bigger? Francium. Francium. This has 87, and it's got that many. Remember our energy levels? We said this would be the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh energy level. So you're moving out in energy levels further and further out, which means your atom is getting bigger. That's pretty easy. Okay, so it says atomic radius is the distance from the center of the atom to the outer edge. As we move down, the atom becomes larger. That's easy. This should make sense. The elements contain more protons, more neutrons, more electrons as you go down the column. But this does not always determine the size. It doesn't always determine the size. More importantly, it's the number of energy levels that what as you go down? What happens to your energy levels? They increase. increase. Number of energy levels increase as you go down a group. For example, if we were to look at something like lithium, and lithium has um, an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s1. So I'm going to put my nucleus right there, my positive nucleus, and then I'm going to do my first energy level, and I have two electrons, 1s2. And then in my second energy level, it's 2s1. So in my second energy level, I just have one lone electron. So I'm going to call this lithium right there. And then, um, so its farthest out electron is in which energy level? What do we say? This is the first energy level. This is the second. So the second energy level is the furthest one out. Now let's draw sodium in the margin here. So we know that sodium has how many protons? How many protons does sodium have? 11. 11. So how many electrons does it have? 11. 11. So we're going to do 11. So we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1 for the electron configuration. 
So it might overlap a little bit, which is okay over here when you're drawing it. So we've got two electrons, and then in our second energy level, we said we can have how many electrons? Eight. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And in our third energy level, how many electrons do we have? Just in this case, for sodium, we only have 3 s one Just one electron out there, okay? And so that gives us our 2 plus our 8 gives us 10 plus one more makes it 11. Which one's bigger? Sodium is obviously bigger, okay? So its farthest out electron is now in the third energy level, making it one energy level bigger. And so what we say is the size is determined by the energy level. Okay, by how many energy levels that you have. As you move across the period from left to right, let's check to see what happens. Well, if we actually looked at the size as we went from left to right, we would actually see that fluorine is smaller than lithium. Question mark, question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point. What? Why is fluorine smaller? How many protons and electrons does lithium have? Three. And how many does fluorine have? Nine. So why is fluorine smaller than lithium? So let's talk about the energy levels. This is 2s2 and this is 2p5. So they're both in which energy level? They both end in which energy level? Second. So their energy level is actually staying constant, which means shielding is constant. We are not changing our number of energy levels. The energy level is still the same. It's two here and it's two here. So we're still in the same energy level. So there's something else we need to look at. Instead of looking at shielding, what are we gonna look at now? The number of protons. We call it the effective nuclear charge. Perfect, I heard that too. It's called the effective nuclear charge. And basically, it's almost like taking two magnets. One magnet is slightly bigger than the other one. In other words, we would have more protons in there. Because what are the protons doing? They're attracting. They're attracting the electrons. Remember, they're positive, so they're attracting the electrons. And what happens is, if you have more protons in the nucleus, they're going to be pulling the electrons in closer. So, if we were to draw out what fluorine would look like, then in comparison to lithium, so let's do fluorine, fluorine is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. So we've got our nucleus, and we've got one S2, so we have our two electrons that are in there. And then in our second energy level, what we have is we have seven electrons instead of eight. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instead of eight. Because our nucleus, instead of having three protons here, now we have nine protons for fluorine. What's going to happen here? What's going to happen? The protons are going to do what? Attract more. This is going to get pulled in closer to the nucleus because we have a stronger magnet in our nucleus. This gets pulled in more. So having nine protons actually makes fluorine smaller than lithium. Okay? We're not comparing it to sodium. We're comparing it to lithium. Okay? So they have the same number of energy levels, but this one, because it has more protons in the nucleus, it's going to be pulling more. So it says, as you go across the periodic table, the atom gets smaller. This goes against our thinking that as you increase your electrons, the atom should get bigger. The reason for this is as you move left to right across the period, there are more what in the nucleus? Protons. Protons. Perfect. So that gives a stronger pull on the outermost electrons, and the stronger attraction pulls the electron orbitals in closer to the nucleus, making the atom Small. smaller. The trends are always going to be opposite. So as you go left to right, it'll be opposite of what happens from top to bottom, so it's going to be really easy to remember. So now we're going to try to phrase this so that we can answer these questions similarly every time. This is going to be more like debate than it is like chemistry, okay? So the question is going to ask you what happens and why, and you want to be able to defend your answer. So it increases as you go down a group due to going down a group. Everybody's reason is always going to be what? Shielding. shielding. Perfect. It's due to the shielding effect or shielding. Why? 
Now I'm going to start on top just so that I have enough room to write this. What we're going to say is the more energy levels that you have, and energy levels you can actually abbreviate, you can just write N for energy levels. Remember when we did that, we said it was N for energy levels. The more energy levels that you have, what ends up happening to your atom? The size of it. Yep, the larger the atom. And all you want to do when you explain is you want to use your definition, which we are right now. We're talking about the size. So we're talking about what radius is. And we're incorporating our definition in our explanation. And it's that simple. It decreases as you go across a period. Everybody, what's this? What letter is this? Z. Z. This is due to Z effect, which is called the effect of nuclear charge. And the way that we're going to start this is instead of saying more energy levels, we're going to say the more what you have. What are we talking about? The nuclear charge? The more protons. Perfect. The more protons that you have in the nucleus, what ends up happening? The smaller it gets because the stronger attraction, the pull, the stronger pull of the electrons in toward the nucleus. Stronger pull of electrons toward nucleus makes the atom smaller. So we want to always make sure that we come back to the definition, which definition of radius is just size. It's talking about whether it's larger or smaller. So what this is showing is this is actually showing atomic radius. And we can see the sizes of these atoms, where from hydrogen to helium all the way down to cesium, what do you notice as you go down the periodic table? What's happening to the size of it? They're getting bigger. And for the most part, don't worry about the exceptions. We won't really talk too much about exceptions at this level. As you go from left to right across the periodic table, what are you noticing here? Smaller. They're getting smaller. Again, why? Well, as you go top to bottom, it's because what? Shield. Shielding. And the more energy levels you have. But as you go left to right, what is it due to? Z effect. And the more what you have? Protons. protons. The more protons you have, the stronger the pull is going to be. Radius ends up being the most difficult one, and it take, takes the longest to explain because we needed to explain these two major trends. Once we have, everybody, what is this called again? Shielding. Shielding. And what is this called? Z effect. Once we have those down, the other two trends that we're going to be talking about will be really simple to go through. So the next one we're going to talk about is called electronegativity. So electronegativity is simply an atom's ability to attract another atom's electrons. And I'm just going to say electron. So it's an atom's ability to attract another atom's electron. And there was a man by the name of Pauling who actually came up with the scale. It's arbitrary. He made it from zero to four. It doesn't actually have any units. He calls the units Paulings, but they're not true units. So he just gave it a scale from zero to four. And so it says the electronegativities of noble gases are zero. This should make sense because what do you know about the noble gases? Do they want an electron? No. no. Do they want to give one away? No. no. They're stable how they are because they have a full what? Energy. energy level. Because of their full energy level, they do not want to give or take any electrons. They're happy the way that they are. So it says um, they're already stable. They have no desire to pull an electron toward them. The group one elements, let's talk about those. So before we do this, let's just refresh on, we need to label the periodic table anyway. So please flip to the very back page of your packet, and let's just refresh on labeling this. So do you remember what this first column, we call this the group 1A elements. These are called the what? Alkali. Alkali metals. All right, what are these called? Alkali. Alkaline. Earth. Very good. Alkaline earth metals. How about all of these in the middle here? What are those called? Very good. Transition metals. Nice. All right. Down here, these are called what? Not transition metals, but? Inner, inner, inner transition. transition metals. Very good. Inner transition metals. The top line is called something based on, you know how it goes 56, 57, 58? It's based on this. Anybody know what that series is called? Lambda. 
lanthanide. Good, because that's called lanthanum, number 57. So this is called the lanthanide series. So then this one is called actinium. So what do you think this one's called? The actinide series. Very good. The actinide series. All right, and then there also is, anybody know what copper, silver, and gold are called? Coinage. Coinage metals. Very nice. These are called the coinage metals. Okay, bordering the staircase, but not including aluminum. Do you remember what those are? Metal. Metalloids. Let's go all the way to the far right on the periodic table. These are called the? Noble gases. Noble gases. Very good. And under fluorine, fluorine and under are called halogens. And then the rest of them, we really just call those non-metals that are inside of there. So metals to the left and then the non-metals to the right if they're not um, metalloids. All right, you see these numbers that are on here? All of these little numbers that you've probably never seen before. And you can see that the noble gases don't have one. Those are actually representing the electronegativity values. So these are in Pauling's. What is the highest number that you can find on this chart? What is the highest number? Fluorine. 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 What's the value of it? Four. four. That's the electronegativity of fluorine is four. Can you find, besides being zero, like the synthesized ones and the noble gases, besides being zero, can you tell me what the lowest number is that you can find? What, what number, what value is it? 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7, francium. What do you notice about the location of these? They're at opposite points on the periodic table, which is telling us that there is a trend in certain directions, okay? So we're gonna talk about the trend of electronegativity as we go left to right, and the trend of electronegativity as we go top to bottom. What do you notice that happens to the electronegativity as we go top to bottom for the most part? It goes down and decreases. But what do we say about radius? The size of the atoms actually got bigger. So we said that the radius did what? The trend is that it increases. Radius decreases going left to right. What do you know about electronegativity? It increases. They're opposite, okay? Radius is gonna be the opposite of the two other trends that we're gonna talk about. So that's another thing that will end up being um, a lot easier to remember also. So we can see that fluorine actually has the highest. So let's talk a little bit about why. So let's come back to, flip back to the first page here. All right, so we know that the electronegativities of the noble gases we said are zero because they're stable, they don't wanna pull electrons. The group one elements, which are those alkali metals, those have really low electronegativities. Why? What do they not wanna do? Attract an electron. What do they want to do? give one away. Why do they want to give one away? So if I look at lithium or sodium or potassium or iridium, why do they want to give one away? They can be more stable like the noble gases and have full energy levels. Perfect. Because if sodium, for example, has 11, we'll, we'll do this in the notes, and it loses one, it now has how many? Like neon. And neon is stable again, is more stable because it has a full energy level. So it says the group one elements are low because they do not want to gain another electron. They don't want to attract another electron. In fact, they want to get rid of the electron that they have. The highest electronegativities are in the group 17 elements. The group 17 is under which one? Is what family? Halogens under fluorine. Why do these have the highest? Yep, they do want to attract one because if they gain one, then what? They, more they have a full energy level. They become more stable. Awesome. And I love that you keep saying that they become more stable. It's perfect. So these have the greatest within, within a period. So they have the what pull on an, elect on an electron? They must have the strongest pull on an electron. Perfect. So now let's talk about why. Why does that happen? So electronegativity, the trend we're going to say decreases as we go down a group. Everybody do it with me. Go down the group. And what is your reason? Shielding. shielding. Awesome. Due to shielding. We're going to phrase it exactly the same way that we started phrasing the other one. The more what? The more energy levels that we have. The more energy levels 
What happens when you have more energy levels? Is it easier to attract electrons or harder to attract more electrons? Harder. harder. So what we're going to say is the weaker attraction for other electron, for another electron, for another electron, because it's an electron of another atom. And as you go across a period, everybody do this with me, as you go across a period, what is that? Z effect, due to the effect of nuclear charge. And how do we start the statement on that one? The more protons that you have, what happens? The more protons that you have, what happens to that? The stronger attraction for other atoms' electrons. Perfect. The more protons you have, the stronger or greater attraction for another atom's electrons. So notice that in this one we talked about size. We said larger and smaller when we did radius. And for electronegativity, we're talking about attraction. So we want to make sure that we discuss attraction when we go to define this. And what's the most electronegative element on the periodic table? We said it's fluorine. Perfect. Fluorine is the most uh, electronegative element. All right, let's move on and let's take a look at ionization energy next. All right, so ionization energy, this is simply the energy that's required to. Well, we said that ion, this word ion, is referring to what? Particles that are charged. So what we're specifically going to talk about, though, anybody remember what we say? Required to? Remove an electron. To remove an electron or electrons. Okay? And what you can have is, you can actually have a first ionization energy, we have a second ionization energy, you can have a third ionization energy, and I'm just going to say dot, dot, dot. What it basically indicates is how many electrons are being removed from the atom. So when you take the first electron away, it requires a certain amount of energy, then you go to take the second one away, and by the way, when you have more protons than you do electrons, it actually becomes harder and harder to take those electrons away every time that you take one away. So we'll talk about that um, later on. We find that in each period going, which way? Which way do periods go? Horizontal. Across, horizontal, perfect. In each period, the elements with the highest ionization energy are the group 18, also called the noble gases, all the way to the right on the periodic table. Why do you think that the noble gases all the way over here, why do you think that those have the highest ionization energy? Full sublevel. They're already happy. They do not want to have an electron removed. Okay. So if you try to take any one of these electrons away, they will fight you. And that's the whole idea of bonding. Remember what happens in bonding is either electrons are being shared or if it's an ionic bond, what's happening? They're not sharing electrons. What are they doing? Taking and giving, good. One of them is pulling the electron off of the other one. The noble gases, scientists have been able to get to bond, but it's very temporary, okay? So they would rather not stay that way. They would rather be back to their normal where they have all the electrons that they started with. They don't want to be bonding. They don't want to share any of their electrons because they are stable. So it says that the noble gases, all the way on the right, these do not want to react with any other elements. And these elements, due to their full what? Energy level, awesome. Due to their full energy level, are already stable and do not need to bond to become stable. All other elements on the periodic table do not have the full sublevels or energy levels. And they attempt to become more stable by bonding with other atoms. And that's the idea of why they bond. The elements gain or lose electrons to become more what? Stable. stable. And I'm writing the word on all caps just because that is such a big part of why this happens. In order to do this, some atoms will lose electrons. For instance, we talked about this. Sodium has 11 electrons, and if it loses one, that's easier than gaining seven to get to 18. So instead, if sodium loses one, it's similar in configuration to what? It has 10 like who? Neon. Yeah. Neon. A noble gas. If it loses one, it's easier than gaining seven to get the same number of electrons as what? Argon, which has 18. 
Therefore, sodium loses one electron. We don't call it Na anymore. We call it Na with what charge? If it loses an electron, then it becomes plus one. Awesome. Within one period, what stays the same? As you go across the periodic table, we call this Z effect. So Z effect is what's changing when we go across the periodic table because our number of protons are increasing. So the effect of the nuclear charge is changing. We call that Z effect. This way is what? Shielding. But when you go across this way, your energy levels are not, are not changing. And if your energy levels are not changing, we call them constant, we can say what is constant? Shielding. shielding. Awesome. Shielding is constant. So if we're going across the periodic table, our shielding remains the same. In other words, our number of energy levels, our number of energy levels remain the same. So we can basically ignore the shielding effect. We're going to ignore the shielding effect. As you go across the periodic table, what does increase? Your number of protons, protons in the nucleus. Awesome. So the effective nuclear charge will be stronger. Therefore, the ionization energy, which we defined as the energy required to do what? Remove an electron or multiple electrons will be higher. Third time's a charm. This means it takes more energy to define it again to do what? Remove what? An electron. Perfect. Okay. So as we go across the periodic table, it makes it harder to remove an electron because our magnet is bigger, it's stronger. It's pulling the electrons in and holding them tighter in. So let's just do this trend then. So as we go down a group, ionization energy decreases. Everybody, due to what? Shielding. Shielding. Why? How did we start this when we phrased it? Because the more what? Energy. More energy levels. Very good. The more energy levels we have now, we want to use the definition of ionization energy. So we're talking about the energy it takes to pull off or remove electrons. <laughs> what can you tell me? The more energy levels you have, does it become take less energy or more energy to pull off an electron? So let's take a look back before we answer this question. Here's an atom where here's our nucleus, okay? And we've got electrons that are being shielded from the nucleus. And there we've got layers and layers. And in this case, here's our nucleus, and our electrons are really close, okay? So as we have more and more energy levels, I want you to think back to the concert example. Is it easier, or does it require less energy for someone who's really close to the nucleus to leave and go to the bathroom and go take care of things and go get food? Or is it easier for someone that's all the way further out for them to leave and go to the bathroom and show, socialize and go and, like, chat on their phone? Which one requires less energy to be able to pull away? The one that's further away or the one that's closer? Further away. further away. So let's come back to this question. What this one says is why? So if we have more energy levels, the further out that we get, is it, does it require less energy or more energy? Less. Perfect. The more energy levels that we have, the less energy to remove an electron because basically the idea is that the attraction of the nucleus because of the shielding the attraction is less the further out that you get I'm just gonna say in parentheses because those are uh, outside electrons electrons are less attracted than the ones that are closer in so now let's go across a period well, if we go across a period, everybody, what's this do to? Z effect. And how do we start this one off? The more what you have? Protons. The more protons, perfect. The more protons you have. Now let's talk about if you had more protons. If you wanted to remove an electron, if you have more protons, does it require more energy or less energy to pull one off? More. Perfect. The more protons you have, the stronger the attraction, right? Stronger attraction. I'm going to put that in parentheses. So the more protons you have, the more energy to pull an electron off or remove an electron. All right, and the last thing is I have a way of remembering these always, right? So everybody write, going down the periodic table, I want you to write E-I-E. 
are, everybody say ear. 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 And going across the periodic table, E, I, R, say it again, ear. 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 E, guess what E is for? Energy. No. Nope. Electro. Electro. Electronegativity. What is the I for? Ionization energy. And what is the R for? Radius. Awesome. As you go down the periodic table, the trend is that electronegativity decreases, ionization energy decreases, and radius increases. Radius is opposite of the other ones. As you go across the periodic table, electronegativity, if it decreases going down, it actually what? Increases. Ionization energy increases. And guess what's ha what happens to radius? It decreases. You really only need to remember radius and then if you know that the other ones are opposite, then you'll get it. And so if you know that radius going down increases, in other words, the size, in other words, the size of the atom gets bigger, then we can figure out what the other trends are using ear. So let's first do what our trend is from left to right. Electronegativity going from left to right, what happens to it? It increases. So you can write increases with an up arrow. What happens to ionization energy? It also increases. And what happens to radius? It decreases. Why? When we go from left to right, everybody look at me. When we go from left to right again, what is this? It's the effect. Perfect. Now let's do top to bottom. Well, if this is increase, increase, decrease, then this must be decrease, decrease, increase. And what does this do to? Shielding. Awesome. So when we go top to bottom, we're talking about shielding. So what you're going to do is you're basically going to use EIR just to confirm that you've got it right, but then explain using these statements, these defense statements that we do doing. Okay? And that's basically it for periodic trial.